I'm Michelle Walsh. I'm an associate professor at the University of Arizona in Family Studies, and I'm the team lead for the Community Research Evaluation and Development team there as well. And congratulations, you've done it. You've gotten your award. That's a big step, uh, and you should revel in it a bit. But now what? Well, two things, and you'll have seen in some of the other sessions, that you as a principal investigator in particular have a number of uh, roles and responsibilities as you go through uh, your project. Two of the broad categories of those are a legal and professional responsibility to manage uh, the team uh, that you've got, that you've put together in order to execute the project that you outlined in the proposal and the other to assure that the project funds are spent responsibly. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about the first uh, piece of that, and you'll have subsequent sessions that focus more on the budget. But it's really important to keep in mind um, throughout that in managing the project, uh, the funds are part of that throughout, and so keeping that in mind too. So when we're talking about project management, there are a number of components around that. Part of that is planning for it, one of the first steps in that. And luckily, you've produced a very thorough uh, proposal. I, obviously, if you have been funded, that you were able to detail the project as you anticipate it playing out uh, in all kinds of aspects. And you're going to be able to refer back to that proposal uh, to do the planning for the project and to make sure that you can move forward in that way. You're also going to organize your team, another step in that, bring them uh, together to really make sure that the planning that you've done has been executed appropriately, that everybody knows their roles and responsibilities to make sure that that happens. And then throughout the course of the project, you're going to continue to monitor and manage that team that you've pulled together, but also the data that are generated through the project. Um, you're going to monitor how well you're progressing throughout the study. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, you're really going to need to tie in the budget. Throughout this session, I'm going to provide you some broad guidelines and approaches that you can use to help you frame these tasks in each of them. But really, you'll want to work with your mentor if you're a novice um, or graduate student and uh, with your colleagues, no matter who you are, in order to develop an approach to these pieces of project management that really works for you. So. First steps in doing that, a, a very important and crucial first step is to really celebrate what you've just accomplished. Uh, throughout the course of the project, one of your main goals as a project manager is to motivate yourself and your team to do high quality work. And the best way that you can do that is to celebrate the successes as you go along. So uh, that's a good opportunity to do this now. There'll be lots of places uh, throughout the project that I hope you do take the time to do that because it is crucial and to really em embrace the positive part of this because there are going to be times <laughs> when um, it, that's more challenging to celebrate when the, the work of it is upon you. So have to take a deep breath and plunge in. So what's the first thing you do? It's really important to complete and submit your IRB or your um, ICUC documents. That's the first step that you're going to have moving forward. Any of your research activities, and by that I mean recruiting participants, doing any of your data collection, can't begin until you get not only the initial IRB or ICUC um, approvals, but also the secondary ones, which you've heard about in previous session. So don't delay. Get that done. That's your first step. And that will be a good opportunity, too. That will be a kickoff and an opportunity to resubmerge yourself in the proposal. You've sat it. It's been sitting on, um, on your sideboard for a while. Uh, now that you're back in, getting those documents together, getting that submitted in a timely manner is going to give you the chance to resubmerge and to get excited about it again. Even though research activities can't begin until you get your start letter, a crucial thing that has um, moved forward, part of the new movement, is that funds are going to be released to you as soon as you uh, get your award letter. And that is going to make a world of difference to you. So now you don't have to wait 
for those uh, approvals to begin preparing for the full launch of your study. In fact, as soon as you get the award letter, it's good to think of that as the start of your study. The research piece, the data collection is going to start once you get your start letter, but you can begin preparing for that full launch now. In fact, if you don't start preparing at this point, really take it from experience, you are not going to finish your uh, study in the timeline that you laid out. These are important months while your IRB work is getting reviewed that you take to really kick off and set your project up for success. And what does that look like? One of the first pieces of that is for you to start preparing your team. Uh, in your proposal, you laid out who's going to be part of it. If you are fortunate enough now that you've got the funding that the type of award that you've received uh, and is in your budget to hire, for instance, a project manager or other kinds of staff, um, now's the time to take those first steps to get those people on board. It's important and can really help the course of your study to have really competent and reliable staff in with you. It can really make the difference um, to the success of a study. So if you have them in your budget, um, now's the time to really select who those staff will be. You've got your uh, key personnel who are going to be working with you. You're without compensation folks, um, and, but you do have the opportunity now to hire your other staff. Um, the first step in that really is to de develop a solid job description. That's going to um, fall on you. You need to know what are the skills that you want this person to possess um, and what sort of experience and expertise do they need to have. You will work with your grantee organization to discuss um, what the appropriate salary range is for someone with these competencies and you'll work really closely with your grantee organization um, to assure that recruitment is appropriate. Where uh, should they be recruiting? They'll have some ideas. You might have some ideas. Um, and to recruit for the study staff here I'm talking about. So that you've got the most qualified candidates coming in. Um, and although you are going to work with your grantee organization, again, you should have a, a lot of input on that job description to make sure that they meet your needs. Uh, also, um, working hopefully with other members of your team, develop an interview guide. Make sure that you've got something that um, consistently addresses that you're going to ask each of your candidates um, consistent questions and that lay out just what it is uh, that you want to have from personnel on your study. And when it comes time to interview, if you can incorporate some of your other uh, colleagues from the team as part of that interview process, you're going to make sure that that person is a good fit for uh, the role that you've got for him or her. Once you've got um, the staff on board, it's going to be very important. You can use this time still while you're still waiting for the IRB to train those team members. Uh, one of the first steps is to assure that everybody has the appropriate IRB training it is typically what's required to assure that they have training in human subjects research or animal care and safety um, and make sure that uh, that's on board. That will have been part of your commitment through your IRB submission that uh, only folks who are properly certified are working on the project. So you can assure that all of your team have that um, and make sure that they're well oriented to the project. Everyone's had a chance to look at the protocol work through the protocol and know and understand their roles and expectations. And that goes not only for the hired staff, but for the other members of your team. Again, encourage them to take this time to, to um, review and renew their uh, familiarity with the proposal and what's going to be expected. Also, uh, it's important to remember that if you, in your protocol and reviewing it, that you may have express that your staff will have particular training in whether it's a data collection technique, whether it's blood draws, whether it's uh, you know interviewing, other sorts of um, specialty training that was uh, going to happen uh, 
in before data collection happened or early on in the process, again, now's the time when that can happen. Um, so assure that you've got everybody that's trained and up to speed. Again, this is going to allow you to launch the research portion of your project in a very timely way. In addition to getting your team and your staff and your personnel ready and prepared to, for the full launch, uh, you also are going to want to prepare the physical environment that you're working in. Essentially, you want to establish your lab. Uh, you're going to, now that you've got staff on board, where are they going to be? Some of this is conversation with a facility, wherever you'll be doing the data collection. Do they have that um, space available? Where are they going to be? You'll, prob you'll need to order your equipment so that they're poised and ready to go. Um, and any other kinds of supplies that you might need, again, to launch this study as soon as you're ready. You'll also want to start organizing your materials for data collection. And this is something that you can do in advance. It's true that the IRB will be reviewing a lot of your data collection materials and will be signing off on the final versions of those, of the consent forms and whatnot. Uh, but you can start um, developing prototype materials so that you're poised and ready. For instance, if you're collecting information from individual participants, one of the tricks of the trade, if you will, uh, that's very helpful is to actually have individual folders for each of your participants. And in those folders, you would have all the uh, data collection tools that you're going to be using in the order that you're going to use them. So, you, for instance, what's the, the process for um, getting them consented? What's really helpful in thinking through this is really virtually walking through that process of data collection. So looking at, all right, what's the first thing they do? First thing is it is it screening? Is there a minor screening beforehand so that we would need a screening tool in there? Um, or is consent the first step? What are the instruments that we'll be collecting in, in what order? Um, do they all have a subject number on them? How are we going to track, develop tracking sheets for whether or not each person has accomplished um, and done any of these? If they're done electronically, how will we know they're submitted? So really thinking through that process and coming up with a um, standard for what those look like, if they're paper and pencil, if they're electronic, and having that really in individual folders. Now, you probably don't want to do all your photocopying uh, and printing before you have your IRB approval of each of those. So you've had situations where they want a little tweak in one of your materials. If you've already copied 200 of those, uh, that's, uh, you're going to regret that. Um, but you could at least have a prototype, have your team members review it, have the staff who are going to be the data collection people review that and make sure that it makes a lot of sense. You might also consider, and going through that, what is it that your participants may need to know about the study so that you could help them step through it and know what to expect and anticipate. Again, all of this is towards having um, better data quality uh, as you work through and really uh, consistent data collection processes throughout the course of your study. Next thing to think about as you've got data collection in mind and you're laying out the processes for that is how you're going to manage the data that come in and what it is you're going to do with all these forms or electronic files, uh, etc. And one of the first steps in that to think through is to assure confidentiality in your proposal and in your IRB uh, submission documents, you have laid out and uh, how it is that you are going to maintain confidentiality of all of these data. So make sure that you have everything in place to do that. If you say that you would have a locked office where these things are stored in a locked file cabinet, assure that that's what's going to happen, that that's where the data will be stored, that you have that available as soon as they start coming in. Um, for the data files, if, um, make sure that your server meets all of the standards that you had set up, that it's password protected if that's what you've said, um, and that you are prepared to adhere to all of those confidentiality standards that you laid out. You also, in this time, have the opportunity to begin to develop any databases that you plan to use and making sure that they're useful and are ready to start again right off the bat. You've got all these data coming in that you need to have somewhere to put them. So 
one of the first steps is really to assure that they meet your institutional guidelines and requirements. Some, um, uh, again, as part of your responsibility as a PI is to be familiar with what those are in, in your institution, in that particular facility. Um, any guidelines that they have for, for research, you are obligated to meet those as well as any obligations to, to TSNRP. You're also required to meet any regulatory requirements. So all of those you should be familiar with and assure that the databases you develop meet those standards and protocols. Um, as you're developing these, it's wise, really essential, to consult your data analyst in this process to assure that the way that you're, you're planning to store the data, the way that you're planning to code the data, all um, allow themselves um, to facilitate the analysis down the road, whether that's quantitative analysis, whether that's qualitative analysis, however it is, whoever you're working with, make sure that the data as they come in are are poised and ready for that. You're going to save yourself a big headache down the road of um, reformatting everything if you can do it the right way the first time. So that's really key. As part of that too, you're going to want to develop um, data code books that really lay out how it is you're coding them. So if male um, is going in the database as one, female is going in the database as two, make sure that you note that so that when the, the time comes, you know, it's really clear to whoever comes if you've had staff turnover, if you forget yourself, that one's pretty easy. But once you're down the road and you have four or five categories of data and you can't remember quite what was one or two, too, you're going to help your data cleaning, your data accuracy, um, if you have an accurate code book. And so part of that process going forward, too, is to make sure that stays up to date. Once you do launch your project and are, have data coming in, and you're changing variables, you're creating new variables, especially come the analysis time, be sure that any of that is uh, included in your code books and is updated regularly. This is a great time to develop file naming conventions. This is something where we often fall down um, and we start naming files, you know, higgledy piggledy, they mean something. It's um, to us at the time, and then later on we look at them and we have no idea what that is. If up front you develop a structured and standard naming convention, then you are going to be well positioned to know. So whether it's for particular individuals and it always has a code number in it, or it includes the date or a version number, uh, whatever that is, make sure that it's consistent and that it's something that your entire team is trained in. And that's going to really save you a lot of headaches down the road as well. Another part of the thinking that you should do up front before you collect any piece of data is to plan for how you're going to maintain your data accuracy. Uh, what is going to be your policy for assuring that data that are entered are accurate? It includes uh, data completion. How are you going to, if folks are doing questionnaires, how are you going to assure that they're fully completed if they need to be? Uh, when data, if they're being hand entered, uh, you may want those data to be entered twice so that uh, if you have one staff entering um, the one time just to assure accuracy, they're entered twice and there are techniques for comparing those files and where there is um, a discord that you can review that. Um, so whatever your approach and policy is for that, but some way to assure that those da data are regularly reviewed and are assured to be accurate. And you'll want to continue that sort of monitoring and have a policy for that sort of monitoring and for backup of data to assure they're not corrupted and whatnot on a basis. And now is the time to plan that and land, lay all that out before you've got the data that are rolling in on top of you. So. One of our goals in doing research is really to have the most accurate data that we can so that we have the most robust and reliable findings. Um, uh, as it says here, uh, the, there are good clinical practice standards that have been developed. These standards are required by the FDA and by NIH studies for those who are participating in clinical trials. One of those guidelines is that systems with procedures that assure the quality of every aspect of the trial should be implemented. And although TSNRP doesn't require adherence to these clinical practice standards, it's uh, 
a very good idea for you as a researcher to be familiar with what they are and to do your best to incorporate them into your own work because that idea of the quality of every aspect of the study that we have uh, is something we're all striving for. So one part of that that's very, very useful and that helps assure the success of all your study, we've already talked about all of this planning that you're doing, all of these procedures that you're developing. You would want to develop a lab notebook, a study protocol um, notebook that is essentially the standard operating procedures for your study. This is going to be a resource that's uh, going to be available to everybody in the team so that you're all on the same page. And this kind of standardization is what's going to help you run a tight ship and assure that the data that you have are high quality. So this uh, handbook is going to be unique to your study. The, a lot of what I've just gone over can provide the guidelines for some of the things that should go into that. But um, you'll really want to work with your mentors, with your colleagues on the team to develop a handbook that makes sense to you all. Um, ask to look at your colleagues' study handbooks. S ask them what's been useful in for them, uh, folks in your area of research, what's been essential for them, what they wish they would have done. Um, and take this time that you have before you get your start letter to um, assure that that's together and to make a commitment to keeping it up to date throughout the course of the study. A big part of that too then as you're going through is to take the timeline that you developed for your proposal and really unpack each of the activities in that timeline. Um, recognize uh, you know, whose roles and whose responsibilities they're going to be to make sure that those are accomplished and include all of that in this handbook um, that you have sitting there, it's on the shelf, and you're, now you're just ready and waiting for that start letter to come through. So that day arrives, you get your start letter from TSNRP um, through your grantee organization and What's your first step? Your very first step, of course, is to celebrate again, because that's really crucial. And now that's been a big process there. You know, I'm sure you've been in touch with the IRB or the ICUC um, to make sure that all your documents are ready. But now the start letter's in hand. And again, take that time, you know, uh, celebrate it again. And uh, then pull your team together. Have a team kickoff meeting. This is essential. Um, again, it's been likely a few months, um, the same way it was with the review of your proposal. People have sort of spurred off, have other things on their mind. This is a time with a kickoff meeting, you bring everybody back together uh, in person if you can. Uh, that, that's still, even in this high tech age, um, being in person is great. We understand that can't always happen, so at least virtually. Um, but take the time to have a meeting to bring everyone together. You're going to clarify um, and their roles and responsibilities and recommit to those on the project. That's this, an opportunity to do that. Um, you're going to have the handbook. This is something everybody should have in hand now. And going through that, you're going to be able to review the timeline, review the tasks and whose responsibilities um, those are, making sure that everybody's clear on what needs to happen and the time in which it needs to. Sorry. Now's the time that you'll discuss the next phases. Um, you'll discuss recruitment of your subject participants now and um, how it is you're going to walk through all your consent processes. You're also going to have the opportunity to be clear about the data collection and management, all of the procedures that you've just gone through. Again, make sure everybody's clear on those, the naming conventions, everything we've just discussed is uh, something that the entire team knows about and is bought into. An important part of this too is to develop your communication plan. How often are you going to meet as a full team? Who's going to meet separately? Who's um, going to be in charge of communicating with uh, the facility, with uh, any of the uh, groups that are stakeholders in the process, whether they're uh, direct command or other sorts of 
um, participants. So having a communication plan and a timeline for when and how you'll get together next is going to be crucial. As part of this then, another piece that I would ask you to commit to and for the whole team to commit to is the idea of auditing and to really incorporate this principle, auditing principle, throughout the project. And what do we mean by auditing? Essentially, really examining everything that's happening in the project, all activities, all documents, um, to make sure that the protocols are being followed. You have standard operating procedures. Are they in place? Uh, are you consenting people the way that you said you would? Are you collecting the data the way you said you would? Are the naming conventions that you had being followed? It's very easy as the study progresses to uh, have a bit of drift and things aren't quite as tight. And uh, without the opportunity to come back and have some accountability, uh, it's, it's easy to let things slide. So this audit piece is really crucial. Uh, and you may have regulatory requirements for auditing depending on the type of study you have or other sorts of facility requirements. However, TSNRP rarely does an external auditing without some kind of triggering cause. So this auditing, if it's not regulatorily required, is something that you will take on it and um, hold to as part of your own standard operating procedures. And I really do hope that you will because it's a part of good clinical practice uh, and will tremendously help assure the uh, fidelity of the work that you're doing in the study that you have and can really make a difference, again, in the reliability and what we're finding out. It makes for good science. Going throughout then the study project, now that you've launched well, you've committed to this kind of monitoring and a timeline for it and when you will, they'll still have the um, more routine monitoring pieces. And for that, communication is going to be the key to make this a successful project. Um, and so how it is that you're going to communicate with the team, you've talked about that in your kickoff meeting. You'll also be communicating regularly with your sponsors. A lot of the other sessions will talk about some of the requirements for any adjustments that you may need to make to your protocol and how to keep TSNRP informed on any of those changes and the processes that you might need to go to to formally document them, uh, including anything with your IRB uh, or any other sort of monitoring boards that you have a requirement to. Also keep in mind that you want to communicate with those other stakeholders. If you are have been given permission to collect data in a particular facility or unit or clinic, um, then building that relationship, letting folks know where the project stands, what the successes have been to date, uh, and any of those other, any challenges that you've had uh, and how things are going, that kind of progress uh, report that you might give to other stakeholders, even if it's not uh, a requirement of your study, is going to help make sure that it moves along smoothly. So part of that sort of monitoring then are these various reports, whether they're informal progress reports and interim ones um, to various teams, or some of the more formal and required reports that you'll hear about in other sessions, uh, whether they're annual reports to the sponsor or the final report that you put together. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that that's part of your monitoring responsibility too, and that's part of project management and solid project management. So complete those on time and accurately uh, will be key to your future success for funding uh, as well as a current uh, well-run and um, smoothly run study. So uh, do be sure that you keep in mind all those timelines. Luckily, now you've spent so much time preparing, so much time planning, you have your standard operating procedures in place, you're communicating well with your team. These reports will be easy to do because you'll have been documenting along the way and you'll know exactly where you are through this careful monitoring uh, and enable you to put together something that's very satisfying and I'm sure will speak to a wildly successful project where you found many important things of, of military relevance and nurse and other scientific relevance. So do go forth, um, do a wonderful job, and continue to find many, many reasons to celebrate. Congratulations again.